Hey everybody, welcome back to Leosophy. This is the first installment of the uh, Arachnology series. So uh, we're going to cover spiders, and also I'm going to give a little backstory on what is an arachnid, because otherwise you're just going to kind of go into it blind. So, what is an arachnid? Well, arachnida is a class, and it's part of the subphylum Chalicerata, and that is important. Um, when you think of arthropods, an arthropod is an animal that has an exoskeleton on the outside and joints attached. So unlike, for example, an echinoderm, it actually has joints as part of its exoskeleton. When people think of arthropods, they generally think of insects, crustaceans, and uh, arachnids. <coughs> and it's important to note that if you look at crustaceans and insects, what they have in common is mandibles, chewing mouth parts. They also both have compound eyes. The adults have uh, antennae, sensory organs. Uh, I've covered this in a previous video, but it's good to give kind of a little refresher on that. Whereas arachnids, they, uh, they're, they're most notable for, for having chalicery. That's, that's why the subphylum is called chalicerata. Only arachnids and horseshoe crabs are part of this subphylum. Um, and those are their mouth parts. Instead of the chewing mouth parts, they have these interesting big tubular shaped muscles with uh, either chewing or piercing mouth parts attached. Fangs or just chompers. I don't actually think there... Is there a word for that? i got to look into that. Anyway. Um, Another other thing that uh, arachnids have is they have eight legs, generally, and they have their body is divided into two rather than three, like insects' uh, segments. Instead of a head, thorax, and abdomen, which is what insects have, they have a cephalothorax, which just means head and thorax combined, and it's usually kind of like this interesting little half moon shape, and that's where the eyes and some of the central organs are, and then you have an abdomen. And also, uh, lastly, they don't have any antennae, although we're going to get into some interesting adaptations that they found to uh, overcome the lack of antennae later on. Not for spiders, but yeah. And also they have simple eyes like us. So no compound eyes in arachnida whatsoever, or chalicerata for that matter, because uh, horseshoe crabs also don't have compound eyes. Now that you kind of understand a little bit more as to what makes an arachnid, I'll jump into spiders and what makes them unique. So... Uh, as previously mentioned, all spiders have eight legs, all spiders have chalicery, all spiders have simple eyes, and all spiders' uh, bodies are divided into two segments, an abdomen and a cephalothorax. What makes spiders unique and different from the rest of uh, arachnida, although there's a little bit of overlap here, um, is one, their chalicery terminate in fangs that produce venom. That is huge. A lot of arachnids have chewing mouth parts or uh, piercing sucking mouth parts. Spiders, on the other hand, they have fangs that envenomate their prey. This is one of the reasons why I'm a little annoyed whenever people ask if a spider is poisonous. Because, one, venom and poison aren't the same thing. Venom is injected, poison is ingested or absorbed. So poison ivy is poisonous. Uh, poison dart frogs are poisonous. Rattlesnakes and brown recluses are venomous. But all spiders are venomous. They all eat by injecting venom into their prey, which liquefies the prey, and then they suck it up through their very small and almost stoma-like mouth that's just uh, beneath the uh, fangs, the chalicery as well. Um, it also annoys me for that reason when people ask uh, in the tarantula hobby, well, has it been defanged? Well, then it's going to die. I mean, that would be like buying a dog with no stomach. Like, that's their means of ingesting. They don't have chewing mouth parts. So spiders, all of them, that's how they eat. They, they are all obligate predators. There's one really interesting exception to that, uh, Bagheera kiplingi, which is still a predator, but it, it can actually supplement its diet thanks to a really weird relationship it has um, with a tree that I, for some reason, can't think of. But this tree actually produces... Um, like a nutrient-rich sap that the whole point of it is actually because Bagheera kiplingi is still a, uh, a predator, it, it's actually bribing the spider to stay on the tree and eat uh, the ants that cause problems for it. Uh, oh, it's an acacia tree. I remember now. Um, anyway, that's one of the weird exceptions, but all spiders are obligate predators. All spiders, once they've taken down their prey, whether it's by overpowering it, ambushing it, using a web, no matter what, they envenomate the prey using their fangs and little hollow uh, spigots, or not spigots, uh, openings on those fangs that, that secrete the venom. It liquefies them and then they suck them down uh, once the, the flesh has been liquefied. Additionally, 
they all have silk glands. Now, the way those silk are produced is pretty varied. They have spinnerets, but some of them have really complicated organs, um, and some of them don't actually make webs at all, but they, they do still produce silk. Some of them have these peculiar spigot-like uh, organs, which is, I was thinking of that when I was talking about the, the fangs, that's why I said spigot earlier. Uh, it, and some of them have crivellate organs that are just a whole bunch of little tubes, really complicated. Ogreface spiders, for example, have that. Really varied how they produce silk, but they do produce silk. And some of them make webs to capture their prey, and some of them just use it to enhance their sensory abilities. That's another interesting thing about spiders. With the exception of Salticity, the jumping spiders, of which Bagheera kiplingi belongs, by the way, the uh, what people call an herbivorous spider, even though it's not. Um, with the exception of Salticity and a few others, Ogreface do have good vision, for example. Most spiders, not great on the visual front. Most of them have, like, Mr. Magoo vision. And the ones that don't produce webs, one of the advantages of silk in that instance is actually to enhance their sensory perception because they use touch to find their way around the world and to feel out what's uh, around the corner, whether it's a predator or a prey or what have you, a potential mate. And uh, silk allows them to sort of enhance that because it makes those vibrations that much stronger. That's why with uh, tarantulas, for example, you'll see silk at the overlapping on the substrate that they have, almost like a strange carpet, and it's, that's why. It's literally so they can feel things. Um, and actually, speaking of tarantulas, there's actually two families that are kind of like what divide spiders. You've got Araniomorphia, Araniomorpha, and that means spider-shaped. So that's what we call true spiders. Araniomorphs are the ones that you probably, unless you live in a subtropical or desert area, they're the spiders that you associate with the term spider. They're the ones that make webs. They're the ones that get in your house and, you know, things of that sort. House spiders, garden spiders, orb weavers, uh, what some people call daddy long legs, but they're actually often called uh, cellar spiders, wolf spiders, all those. Those are all true spiders. And one of the ways that you can really determine it, that they are true spiders is uh, the overall shape of the calicerian fangs, the relationship that they have. Their fangs sort of go in a pincer-like shape, so it's like that. The fangs are, go left to right, in other words. Then on the other hand, you've got megalomorpha. That's funnel webs, trapdoor spiders, and most notably, tarantulas. Megalomorpha means shrew shape, and that's because the fangs go up and down, kind of the way a uh, shrew's buck teeth go, and that's why it's called that. I think that's the worst name. I don't know why they decided to go with that description, but, excuse me, I can't think of a much better one either, though, at the same time, so that's that's the difference, and those are, that's where they sort of diverged into two very different kinds of animals, and you can really see that with uh, the fact that Megalomorpha never has webbing, um, I mean, never has webs, sorry. All spiders make webs, they use silk, but they don't make webs to capture prey. Uh, and another advantage that uh, these webs have, in the case, for example, of salticity and other wandering spiders, wolf spiders, uh, things like that, spiders that don't normally make webs to capture their prey, um, the silk actually provides both a trail of breadcrumbs that they can follow back to wherever they hit out at, because, again, all animals need places to hide. That's, uh, that's one thing that in a lot of animal experimentations they don't factor for, and then they wonder why all of their test uh, subjects were predated. It's, well... All animals need some place to uh, kind of lay low at some point in their, their lives. Same thing goes for even obligate predators like spiders. So uh, it allows them to sort of follow it back, and it also allows them to use it as sort of a... Uh, what's that called when people are on trapeze, trapezes and they uh, fall? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, a safety net. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. It also works kind of like a safety net. So like a jumping spider, for example, it jumps a great distance to capture something. If it misses and it falls, instead of falling a great distance, it can use a silk line to, to catch itself. And they all do that. If you actually pay close attention to uh, most wandering spiders of any kind, um, any kind of, of spider that doesn't stay put in a web, you'll see they're making a little line behind them. And that's in case they fall or have to run really fast from a potential predator. So, yeah, 
bottom line, the real thing to take home here is silk has a lot of uses with spiders. It even plays a role in the reproduction, and that's the other thing I'm going to go into. With Megalomorpha, it's really hard to sex them, but with true spiders, you can, if you know this little secret, I wish I could use some pictures for this, but uh, anyway, if you know this one little secret, you can sex true spiders at a glance. You can tell the difference immediately, and that is the pedipalps. That's the part of their anatomy I haven't covered yet. So you've got the, the abdomen, you've got the cephalothorax, you've got eight legs, you've got two tubular muscles called cholesterol, and you've got the fangs that terminate out from the cholesterol. Well, additionally, and some people have, have actually had send me pictures and they say, what is this? It looks like a spider, but it's got ten legs. Well, they have two little sensory organs in front of their faces called pedipalps, which means like almost a foot or almost a leg. Makes kind of good sense in that sense because they look kind of like half legs or quarter legs. And in jumping spiders, they're particularly cute. Those are the little pom-poms that you see them kind of shaking around all the time. Um, if you look at the pedipalps of a spider, true spider, that's very important. If you do try this with tarantulas, it's not going to work. They, sexing tarantulas is incredibly difficult. You have to use their molts, actually, to, you to like, like minor surgery on their shed exoskeleton to see if they have an epigynal uh, flap or not. But, which means they're female. But anyway, in true spiders, the pedipalps, if they're symmetrical, if they're just nice and even, then you've got a female. But if they're asymmetrical, if they're bulbous on the ends, in other words, instead of having a nice, clean cylinder shape, uh, like the way their legs are shaped, if instead they, they really bulge out at the end like boxing gloves, then you've got a male. That's how I always think of it. Like, if they look like they're wearing boxing gloves, then it's a male spider. Interestingly enough, in that uh, organ in the pedipalps, there's a corkscrew shaped uh, organ that is their sexual organ. It's how the males reproduce. And what they do, and the reason why I'm tying this back into the silk producing glands, males produce, once they reach maturity, what's called a sperm web. They basically take sperm, they wrap it in silk, and then they take that corkscrew like appendage and they twine it all the way into their pedipalp and they carry it around. And then when it comes time to uh, mate with a female, they find a receptive female, who again, also another case in point with the use of silk, it has pheromones on it that allows them to sort of identify each other, so it doesn't lead to like an immediate cannibalism kind of scenario. Uh, the male taps on the silk, female knows that it's a male of her species based on that. They play what looks like patty cake. I guess Who Framed Roger Rabbit was like a documentary in that sense. That That's actually how they do reproduce. Um, the male takes the uh, corkscrew out of his pedipalp, places it into the uh, female's epigyne, which uh, it's kind of funny. Ep you know, pedipalp means kind of like half a leg or whatever. Epigyne means almost a cooter. Uh, so he, he places it in there. It, go it gets into a storage area called a spermatheca which is how a female can store uh, male sperm until she molts. Um, so not indefinitely. Once a female molts, everything internally uh, is lost. And so uh, that male's genetic legacy, if it's not passed on before she molts in the form of fertilizing her eggs, that's it for him. Um, uh, which is one of the reasons why males don't live as long. They have kind of a, a short window, a very competitive window to find a female and mate. And that leads to the other thing I was going to bring up, sexual cannibalism. It's very bizarre for a human to, to see that. And we tend to think of it as sort of a, an aggressive act, like a negative thing, like, oh, poor dude. But a lot of males actually actively uh, contour their body towards a female's fangs in order to be consumed. And the reason for this is, one, once they reach maturity, they don't have long to live, and two, if their body provides the resources for like a hundred babies to live on for the next generation, from a uh, biological standpoint, it's totally worth it. And so it's not the same as, as it, it, it's easy to apply to anthropomorphize and apply human traits to these animals when it's a totally different kind of phenomenon. And it, from a biological standpoint, it absolutely makes sense also not as common as people think, especially like, for example, people think the Black Widow always eats her mate. Actually, very very rarely does this happen. Um, I'd say probably, if I had to guess across the board, sweeping generalization for spiders, I'd say about 25% of the time, some far less, some almost non-existent, and some much more frequent. But 
sexual cannibalism is not super, super common to, uh, to spiders, but it's obviously more common than humans uh, and most mammals, uh, pretty much all mammals. Um, that being said, like I said, it's, it's, it makes sense. And the same thing happens with a lot of uh, mother spiders. They have the babies, the babies hatch, they eat the mother. Well, again, she doesn't have long to live, and her body provides resources that would last them. Uh, uh, you're talking about passing your genes on to 100 potential offspring to carry uh, your traits out into the future. It, it makes good sense within that context because that is the goal of every living thing, to survive long enough to reproduce and then to pass their genes on to a subsequent generation. Um, yeah, let's see. What else? What have I not covered about spiders? Covered their senses? Covered their venom? That's all I can think of now. That's interesting. Um, yeah, and also this video's taking a while, too. I don't want it to be too, too long. Uh, like, share, subscribe, keep asking questions, and next vid is going to be scorpions. See ya.